Hi, my name is Yuying. I'm the senior manager of perception at Cruise. On the surface, driving seems fairly straightforward. Our autonomous vehicles first build a 360 degree view of the scene around them and make the right decisions for how to brake, turn, or move forward. For example, when a car backs up, we understand its intention, imagine its future movement, and slow down for it. But driving in the city is hard even for humans. Here is a small taste of what our cars encounter on any given day. Of course, with these thousands of cars driving on the road, we also see cars with open doors, cars unloading another car, or cars carrying oversized long sticks that you need to carefully measure the shape and calculate the right path around it. Sometimes we also find unusual objects on streets, such as raccoons in the middle of the night, trash being flying across the street, or a dust storm out of nowhere. We need to recognize all the unusual objects and make the right decision to stop or drive through. The uncommon behaviors from other agents can also make city driving extremely challenging such as pedestrians running across the street or blow-throughs from emergency vehicles right around the corner. Not only might other people break the rules, following the rules of the road isn't always sufficient. And this is especially true in a city because the rules don't account for context or interpretation of a given scene. Take this video for example. You should never cross a lane to be in oncoming traffic, but here that's necessary. There are multiple things happening at once here. The delivery truck pushing us to assert into oncoming traffic while yielding to a cyclist and moving further into an opposing bike lane that require a more dynamic understanding. A simple rule-based system doesn't cut it. Those rule-breaking scenarios, blow-throughs, heart attack moments are often referred to as the long tail since people assume they happen rarely on the road However, in San Francisco, bike blow-through happens every hour and a stop sign blow-through happens every 20 minutes. It's 46 times more frequent in a city than in suburban areas. This level of complexity and density makes San Francisco the ideal testing ground for AV development and exactly why we started here first and why I was so excited to join Cruise. To make sense of this dynamic and oftentimes chaotic city, we built our AI system that is able to generalize to long tail scenarios, reason under uncertainty, and learn continuously. At a high level, the system takes all sensor data as input, from camera, LIDAR, audio, to radar. Raw data goes through advanced deep learning neural networks with shared backbone and feeds to different tasks. For example, we build panoptic segmentation to recognize trash beans and other objects. We use fine grain classification to distinguish emergency vehicles from other cars. We also recognize objects' attributes, such as taillights and open door. We track objects across time and sensors to estimate their motions. For every agent on the road, we also predict their future behaviors. And when we can't see a certain part of the world, we understand the occlusion and drive cautiously. Now let me show you why our AI system is designed in this way. Emergency vehicles by nature have unexpected behaviors which makes them a great example for why we need so many sensors. You first need cameras to recognize a car is an emergency vehicle and its flashing lights are on. You also need LiDAR to watch out for open doors and other things that may stick out, especially during nighttime when the lighting is poor. Sometimes the emergency vehicle is so far away or around the corner and you can't see it. Then you can use audio to hear the high pitch of the siren and yield in time. When there's heavy rain or fog and the visibility on camera and the LiDAR is hindered, you can still rely on radar to see through. Because we need to handle all these long tail cases, our AI system from day one integrates all sensors for safety. Now let's move from multi-sensor input to multitask outputs, and we'll start with object tracking. At Cruise, we build an LSTM-based tracking model to associate objects across sensors and through time to measure their kinematics, such as velocity and turn rate. 
there are many traditional filtering-based algorithms in literature, such as common filter or particle filter. Compared to them, a deep learning-based model adapts and scales better for sudden kinematic change while maintaining good performance on normal cases. On the right, you'll see two such examples, a pulling out of parking on the top and aggressive cutting on the bottom. In both cases, you'll see our tracking model is able to capture the sudden change of turn rate and velocity much faster than a non-deep learning system. Through simulation, we find that even 100 milliseconds faster, it can avoid a simulated collision. Our AI system not only measures an object's instantaneous motions, but also predicts how it will behave in the future. When you see this oncoming car, you'll notice it's steering to its right, and you may assume it will turn right and therefore irrelevant to your driving decision. However, the car was actually trying to make a U-turn. And in this four-way stop intersection, no matter how shocked you are, you need to wait for it patiently. Therefore, our autonomous vehicle cannot just simply extrapolate objects' current velocity and make decisions based on that. As you will see here, cruise AVs have higher level prediction that can robustly distinguish a simple right turn from a U-turn in disguise. In cruise, we build an end-to-end -end deep learning-based prediction model trained on tens of millions of examples in a self-supervised way. At a high level, the model consists of an encoder and a decoder. The encoder takes each object's history and the context of the scene as input. It learns a latent representation of the full scene, including the interaction between multiple agents through a graph attention network. It then adds a structured capability through a mixture of expert design to model the distinct patterns of a diverse set of behaviors. The decoder, on the other hand, has two subgroups. The first is two-stage multimodal trajectory prediction. It outputs a multimodal distribution of trajectories with positional variance. It is achieved through an initial prediction and a refinement step for the longer time horizon. The second part of the decoder consists of various auxiliary tasks. For example, to model interactions between multiple agents, it predicts joint trajectories, the existence, and the resolution of interactions. To model the longer-term road geometry and context better, it also predicts the occupancy maps at each future timestamp. Last but not the least, the model is trained entirely in a self-supervised way. We leverage the perception system and the benefit of hindsight to label the future and have developed auto-labelers for auxiliary tasks such as interaction. Next, let's walk through a few examples to understand the design philosophy behind it. In city driving, even a single type of maneuver can have huge variations. We therefore encode our mixture of experts into the model to capture the full variety. On the right, you'll find our model can correctly predict six different trajectories related to parking, including pulling out, parallel parking with multiple attempts, and K-turn. The situation becomes more complicated if there's another agent, say a cyclist, driving by. In this example, we not only predict the car to back up, but also the cyclist would nudge to the left to avoid it, and the car would stop reversing. As a result, our autonomous vehicle breaks sooner to give space for the cyclist. We design our architecture to be interaction-centric. Specifically, we build an agent-to-agent -agent graph with attention mechanism and put a joint loss over trajectories from multiple actors. In addition, we developed interaction autolabelers that can tell whether a pair of agents have an interaction and if so, who wins the interaction. We then use this autolabeler to mine interactive scenarios and define auxiliary tasks about interaction detection and resolution as extra self-supervision. Our system also understands social dynamics. In a busy intersection, our system can reasonably predict 20 people crossing the street one after one, and the car in front will wait patiently and then assert once the crosswalk is all cleared. We expect that in a densely populated city, frequent interactions happen all the time. 
In fact, our San Francisco fleet predicts an average of 32 times as many possible interactions as those in Phoenix. While we try our best to predict as accurately as possible, we also know that the future is inherently uncertain. For example, when a pedestrian approaches an intersection, we don't know which crosswalk they will choose. When a truck on a non-turn lane moves close to the left turn lane, we don't know if it tries to cut in and make a turn, or it will stay in lane and go straight. When the two cars approach a choke point at the same time, we do not know for sure who is going to yield and who is going to assert early on. In all those scenarios, you can see that our prediction model captures these different possibilities. And our model is able to achieve this because our decoder outputs a distribution of trajectories in different modes. However, some trajectory modes have very distinct semantics, but similar geometries. For example, as shown on the right bottom, the two trajectories only diverge slightly on the tail. The one represents staying in the lane and yielding, and the other represents going around and asserting. If you only use L2 distance in loss functions, you are easily end up with two modes collapsing into one. So to avoid this, we developed auto-labelers to differentiate semantics and provide more diverse anchors in addition to latent modes. It's worth noting that in many existing multimodal approaches, the anchors are either fully latent or explicitly specified. Here in Cruise, we actually use both in our models. Not only is the future uncertain, but also the world behind occlusions. Therefore, we design our AI system to understand which part of the world is occluded and proactively anticipate other agents before even seeing them. For example, when a door pops open, we anticipate a pedestrian coming out of the door, so we slow down immediately and steer further away from it. When a big garbage truck blocked our view, even though we couldn't see anything behind it, we still imagine a pedestrian behind the truck wanting to cross the street. In another example, before we drive through an intersection, even though we don't see any cross traffic due to occlusion, we imagine a car crossing from the right, so we slow down, and when we do see a car coming through, we are able to stop in time. In this way, regardless of what will happen in the future or behind the occlusion, our autonomous vehicle is always fully prepared to make safe decisions. So far, we've talked about tasks from object tracking, prediction, to occlusion reasoning. As you can see, our AI system is deep learning heavy, and therefore it needs high quality, high volume data to train. In Cruise, we build continuous learning machines which actively mines data from driving logs and simulations. Then the new data is used to retrain and update models. In the step of data mining, we adapt many machine learning algorithms to increase data effectiveness. One example is that we build few short active learned classifiers to mine certain behaviors. For instance, we want to train models to predict bikes making U-turn. To find similar trajectories, a naive similarity search using embedding features would instead return left turns. This is because the two resemble each other to some extent, and the left turn is just much more common than U-turn. However, with the help of human supervision, which labels only a small number of examples, we can train a classifier with much better accuracy and return a variety of true positive U-turn examples. So we talked about how to understand a dynamic and a complex world. Next, Brandon is going to talk about how AV makes decisions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brandon Basso. I'm the Director of Planning and Controls here at Cruise, and I'm gonna to talk to you today about a really interesting problem called decision-making. I have a background in robotics and machine learning, and this is actually a perfect problem that's in the intersection of both of these areas. So we just heard from Yoon about how we use all this rich understanding about the world to make decisions. I'm gonna focus on the decision-making part. As you can tell, we're making decisions all of the time, especially in a dense city like San Francisco. And some of these decisions are not as obvious as others. 
For example, the decision to slow down for a crosswalk, to creep out to see around a corner, to give a pedestrian an extra bit of room and go past them comfortably and safely. All of these things are decisions, whether they seem like it or not. Some are very big and some are very small. And all together is how we drive with superhuman performance. So how do we define what is a good decision? Of course, we need a problem set up for this. Good decisions for us are, first and foremost, timely. If we have the pedestrian go by, but we make a decision to go past them five seconds, 10 seconds later, a minute later, it wouldn't be a very good decision. We also need to take into account how our decisions affect the world around us and how the world around us is affecting our decisions. This is called the interaction problem, which we'll get into later. Last, these decisions need to be reliable and repeatable. If we do all this correctly, the outcomes are safety, comfort, and this reliability and repeatability point. It's actually incredibly important to just be clear about what the desired outcomes are, safety, comfort, uh, and getting it right frequently all of the time. If we can't do that, then we can't provide a very good experience to our customers. So let's talk about a few challenges with decision making. Two primarily. The first I want to highlight is challenges regarding decision density. And as I said in the beginning, there are actually a ton of decisions to be made all of the time. In these scenes, you can see we're making up to 100 or so pairwise interaction assessments with actors on the road. If we were driving uh, even on the highway or even a, in a less dense city or in suburbia, there would be far fewer interactions to consider, but we need to consider on the order of 100 and just a very typical city scene. All of these interactions, we need to understand what our future actions would be, and that's what these 5,000 or so trajectory rollouts are. And we're not just doing this once every minute or so, this is happening 10 to 100 times a second on the vehicle in order to figure out where to drive. So that's challenge one. Challenge two is uncertainty. And uncertainty is actually present in all of the decisions that we're making, not just some. And I use this example uh, on the right to highlight how no amount of modeling precision is actually going to remove uncertainty. That's in fact not our goal here, because as you can tell with these bikers, the one in the front is probably slightly more likely to go to the left and the one in the back, we really don't know. And infinite modeling precision will never actually account for the inherently uncertain future states of actors like this. So we need to account for this. This is what we call kinematic uncertainty. There's other kinds of uncertainty, existence uncertainty, which we'll talk about a bit, which is the uncertainty of the unknown or what's inside occlusions. And then the last is modeling error, which is a way of saying, how do we account for when the world isn't evolving as we expect? What if one of those bikers turns around or falls over and this is just not captured in one of our models? What do we do in scenarios like that, which we see all of the time, of course, in dense cities where there are tons of bikers? So those are the two challenges. Despite those challenges, we of course have to produce these high fidelity decisions very frequently with high reliability all of the time. Here's how we overcome that. I'm gonna focus this on a key piece of technology we've developed called the cruise decision engine here. And you see at the, at the left, we've taken all the rich understanding from the world that Yoon talked about, that's in perception, and incorporated that into our decision-making process. The goals of that process are on the right, and the, the end goal is actually to produce a controls outcome. So this is braking or steering or accelerating, for example. So let's dive into what's inside these boxes. First and foremost is action generation. What we wanna do is produce joint modes and distributions for all actors in the scene, actually including ourselves. This is called machine learning seeds. We're gonna talk a little bit about this later and how we use it to accelerate our decision making. Once we've understood all of that, uh, we're actually able to do a conflict resolution step. And in this conflict resolution step, we understand our actions, we make initial guesses at it, and then we revise that estimate of where everyone in the world is going, including ourself. Now, we need to densely sample the scene because some trajectories that we are considering might go straight, some might bow out slightly, some might go to the left, and the goal is to pick the very best trajectory from a safety and comfort perspective. So once we do all of that, we can score those trajectories. This is where a lot of nuance lives inside of the scoring. This is a really hard problem to get right. I'm gonna talk through a couple things that we do in scoring. The most obvious one is physics. Think of this as two vehicles can't operate the same space at the same time, otherwise that would be a collision. 
and other physics interactions. This is also where we incorporate some of the rules of the road, like how much distance we need to keep away from uh, cyclists and pedestrians, for example, um, stopping at stop signs, etc. Next, we need to consider uh, comfort, of course. Comfort is how smoothly we're driving around these objects given their uncertainty. And as I mentioned, we're always constantly hedging against an uncertain future. The future is never totally predictable. It might be highly predictable, but it's never totally predictable. In cases where we really just don't know how the world is evolving, we've actually developed a couple novel techniques to totally offline train systems use, using reinforcement learning to understand how to better make decisions when we don't have data or when the world is just evolving in an unpredictable way, which of course happens on the road. Last but not least, we have to consider our route options where we're going in the future as an important signal into costing. If we're trying to go right, we need to understand that we really want to bias uh, our samples of where the AV should go to the right. Last but certainly not least is reflexive plan update. So this is where we actually take all of that and turn this into control actions. We incorporate the dynamics of the world and the dynamics of the vehicle. If you're interested in control theory or robotics, this is where a ton of that stuff lives and we've amassed one of the world's best teams in this area to actually create the correct control actions using a variety of techniques from optimal control and robust control. If we do all of this correctly, which is a hard problem with high frequency, we'll be able to generate the outcomes at the right, which is understanding uncertainty, kinematic uncertainty, existence uncertainty, 360 degree conflict resolution, understanding uncertainty from modeling errors, incorporating models of both the vehicle and the road into our decisions in order to drive safely and comfortably. So next I'm gonna talk through a couple examples of how this plays out on the road. First, kinematic uncertainty. This is probably the easiest to understand. So this is the future actions of other actors in the scene. In this one, you see a fairly intuitive response from the vehicle where as we approach this person on a fairly empty road, getting out of their vehicle, we bow slightly to the left and we slow down. We actually slow down from about 24, 25 miles per hour to 19 miles per hour. This is of course a very safe and intuitive decision, but what's going on underneath the hood isn't just a whole bunch of rules that say, hey, bow out X number of meters when you see a person. What's actually forcing the vehicle to make this maneuver, both slowing down and bowing out slightly to the left is actually our understanding that this person could, with some probability, move into our lane of travel. In that case, we need to hedge against that possible future while still making progress on the road, uh, which is why we're driving 19 miles an hour, not zero. It wouldn't be a very successful ride hail service if in situations like this, we just parked. So of course, the goal is always to make progress despite uncertainty. I wanna show you an interesting example next, which is also about kinematic uncertainty, but a much more critical scenario. So in this case, a cyclist comes directly into our line of travel. And if you watch the video, video carefully, it's actually only within the last several, maybe hundreds of milliseconds that we realize this cyclist is coming into our path. So of course, getting this right has a lot to do with how we do very fast reflexive updates into the planning and control system. But we also have to understand that this actor might come into our path. And what you notice about the AV's trajectory as it takes off from the stop line is it creeps very slowly. It's already hedging against a possible uncertain future that this cyclist who's doing this action that is of course not according to the rules of the road is actually gonna come into our path. So it's in situations like this that we're able to have a much safer vehicle than we would if we didn't account for uncertainty. Okay, so those are great examples of uncertainty. The next I wanna go into is an example of existence uncertainty. For existence uncertainty, we don't see the actors in the scene, so we actually don't know uh, if they're coming out of an occlusion, for example. Yet, of course, we still need to drive safely and comfortably. I love this example because it's taken from the same intersection. The top and the bottom are at the same intersection. This is one that we drive hundreds of times a week in San Francisco. So in the top one, you can see what our uncertainty representation looks like, which is a bunch of cars that could be in that occlusion. We take this into account to drive comfortably, which involves the vehicle pulling out slowly and then going. What's interesting is the bottom example where a vehicle actually does come out of the occlusion. If we didn't drive slowly, then we wouldn't be able to actually hedge against this possible future existence uncertainty where someone does come out of the occlusion. In the next example, 
same story, but this is with pedestrians. If you look carefully, there's a couple pedestrian trajectories that come out from the row of parked cars. Now, this is probably one of the most classic situations that you get in a city where you're driving past a row of parked cars. Next time you drive past a row of parked cars, ask yourself, what intuition are you using to figure out that I actually need to drive slightly slower than the speed limit here? That's exactly the uncertainty hedging the vehicle is doing inside of the decision-making process every single second, hundreds of milliseconds to figure out how to drive. And you'll note it doesn't stop or slam on the brakes for all of these predictions as we drive by. There's in fact no pedestrians there. We drive slightly slower because we're hedging against the future in the case that we would have to stop. So we've talked quite a bit about uncertainty, both existence and kinematic. We also need to understand this existence uncertainty in three dimensions. In this case, it's really interesting. We pull into this intersection and you can't actually understand immediately why the vehicle is slowing to a stop. And they are because there's actually two vehicles that come out of occlusion from over the hill. If we weren't considering uncertainty in all three dimensions, uh, in a city like San Francisco, we wouldn't be able to drive very successfully. So this is to just highlight that we're using this uncertainty understanding, not just in 2D top-down bird's eye view, but in all dimensions at all times. Okay. So we've covered enough about uncertainty. We're going to come back to that later when we talk more about interaction resolution in the presence of uncertainty. But I want to just talk through the basics of what we mean by interaction resolution. Suffice it to say, the car is constantly resolving interactions in a city like San Francisco. Unlike straight road driving that you might see in an empty suburban street where there's really no interactions to resolve, there are tons of interactions going on all the time in cities like San Francisco. And these interactions live exactly at this intersection of world understanding and decision making. So what's happening in these two scenes? In the first one, it's simple. It's a presentation of what the AV's decision is when it decides to yield and how the world evolves, future one, to that action. But it's not sufficient to just consider one possible future. We actually need to consider two possible futures in this case, in which the other road user coming from 12 o'clock actually decides to go straight versus yield. In the second example, we do a rollout where the AV actually decides to assert into this intersection. What you see in these two examples is us scoring the difference between these two interactions in real time understanding what happens if we assert into this intersection, what space does the other vehicle operate versus what happens if we yield in this intersection, what space does the other vehicle occupy in that case. We need to understand both of these when we do our scoring because we also don't want to incur undue road discomfort for other road users and we want to behave safely and comfortably uh, for the people inside our car. So this is how interaction resolution works in real time. Uh, as you can see, this is not just actor pairwise. It's simplified in this picture. This is every single actor on the road, not just for this one. And at a four-way stop, you can imagine at the very least there's three other actors to consider if it's a, if it's a full four-way stop. So how does this work in the real world? This is a really interesting example. I love watching this one because it actually shows the density with which we need to resolve these interactions in real time on the road. So, we first drive around this box truck, um, not a very difficult interaction to resolve. We're pretty sure it stopped. But then you'll notice as we approach this, uh, this um, choke point uh, that's created by the fire engine with the cones around it, we see two actors coming from the opposite direction. And we stop and we let them go through. Now when the third actor comes, we actually assert through this choke point because we actually are understanding in real time that we can occupy that space. And if we do, that they are predicted to yield. Um, as you can imagine, unless, if we're not doing this real-time interaction resolution, we wouldn't be able to resolve situations like this. The other interesting thing I want to point about, out about this example is the right solution in the first two cases is not for us to just stop in the direction of travel of those other two vehicles, the oncomers through the choke point. It's actually to slightly pull over to the right and allow them space to move through. If we didn't do this, we would be creating gridlock everywhere in San Francisco, and that's of course not the ideal outcome. So interaction resolution also involves us taking an action to give way to other road users in situations like this. I love this example because this shows exactly how we resolve interactions in the presence of uncertainty. So most people have experienced this scene where you're driving past a cyclist and the cyclist is going basically your speed and it's unclear when you should overtake. We're in real time understanding the, the fact that they might swerve out at any point. And once we have an understanding built up that they're going straight, and once they actually slow down a little bit, we make the choice to overtake them on the left. 
So this is another example of an interaction resolution in a fairly uncertain scene since we know that cyclists can change direction fairly quickly, but we need to provide safety to them and all road users uh, when we're overtaking them. This is another example of an interaction resolution, um, but it's slightly different from the previous ones. This is a great example of where we've used imitation learning to learn a policy offline that we then apply on the road. In this case, we make this decision that might seem extremely intuitive for us, especially since the lead car goes around to the right. We make this decision to overtake on the right. Getting this right involves understanding that not only is the lead car going right, but the car that stopped is making a left-hand turn. So overtaking on the left would be a very bad decision. And also just staying parked behind them wouldn't be the right call either, since we have enough room to go on the right. We've actually been able to auto-label hundreds of thousands of examples like this offline, collecting more and more every day to understand how to resolve these sort of discrete decisions like overtaking. And then we can then use that online in the costing system to figure out what's the right action in situations like this. Last but not least, modeling error. What happens when we approach situations where something's happening and it's just not according to our predictions? or the situation is evolving slightly differently than we expected as the vehicle starts to drive. This one single image I think captures that really well where there's two people in the intersection and one of them drops a hat. Maybe they turn around, maybe they decide to keep going. Maybe they stop for a while, maybe they go back in the opposite direction. You can imagine that scenes like this happen all the time, but we actually might not have this in our data set. There's many other edge cases out there that just don't show up, even in millions of labeled examples. We actually have to account for that because cities provide new examples every single day like this, many others that we need to address. So what we've done to address situations like this is actually use a technique from reinforcement learning to train a policy offline to understand what happens when pedestrians are very close to the car. Uh, in situations like this, we've actually simulated up to decades of data just for simple interactions like this so we can learn essentially a caution policy for pedestrians near the vehicle. Now, I showed on the right two visualizations of what that policy looks like. And the left one is a little bit more intuitive than the right, so let me explain the left one first. You can view the yellow area, all, all points in this plot, as initial states of the pedestrian. And if the pedestrian were to start in the yellow area, that's actually a pretty unsafe state. They could run towards the vehicle, they could run to the side, but if the vehicle is traveling with an initial velocity, I think in this example it's about 25 miles an hour, there might be a collision. So what you get is this fairly intuitive policy that says, if there's a pedestrian that starts an initial state in the yellow area, behave cautiously because we don't know what they're going to do. Now let me talk through the result on the right for a second, which is super cool. So we're actually able to train offline using a simulated latency. The example on the right has about 400 milliseconds of simulated latency. And what you'll notice is the yellow area is much larger because we need to behave much more cautiously when there is high latency in the system. And we would consider 400 milliseconds to be an extremely high latency in the system. What you'll also notice is that the yellow area extends around to the sides of the vehicle. And that's because if a pedestrian starts in that state and ran very quickly around to the front of the car, it will take some time for us to implement a road action to slow down or stop. So policies like this become not intuitive very quickly and really important to simulate offline because we can go through millions and millions of miles of driving and never see that exact example. So this is a great example of where we're using reinforcement learning to make better cautious decisions online. We can use these same techniques to learn policies offline from multiple actors, in this case, two vehicles, maybe vehicles that we've never actually driven on a public road before, like these two cruise origins shown here. And this is a very interesting problem set up because we give them a, a fairly simple goal, which is to park themselves and to not get into a collision and behave some reasonable vehicle dynamic assumptions um, and uh, behave comfortably. And you'll notice that because we're able to train so many examples offline, they actually learn something fairly intuitive. This is a great way of us bootstrapping when we actually don't have the data or it's very hard to get the data. How do we come up with a reasonable policy for driving these vehicles in these incredibly difficult, highly uncertain environments like parking lots? Okay, so we've talked a lot about how we generate actions and how we resolve interactions on the road. I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the bottom left block, which is incredibly critical to get right, and that's this reflexive update step where all the motion planning and control decisions are happening. Now, 
If you're like me and you spent some time in school studying all this beautiful control theory and um, linear system theory, you might have wondered, well, how does this actually apply to the real world? And I'm here to tell you that we use these techniques every single day, and we have one of the world's best teams here for working on problems like this. The goal is, of course, to produce safe and comfortable, comfortable outcomes at very high frequency, even when something sudden happens on the road. So let's talk through an example of a sudden occluded pedestrian coming out and running across the front of the vehicle. It happens actually very frequently in cities, and this is one of those scenarios that we actually train uh, offline quite a bit, uh, as I mentioned in the previous example of reinforcement learning, but also train on the track very frequently to understand very precisely how our vehicle is responding. Getting this right involves having this very fast path, reflexive update coming from the action generation step directly into motion planning and control. If we didn't have fast reflexes to situations like this, where we just start paying attention exactly to the actor of interest and very quickly, in this case, slam on the brakes, we wouldn't have a very uh, safe and reliable system. This is incredibly important to build in from day one in any system that's driving in a dense city. The next step I wanna talk through is how we actually use machine learning to speed up the decision-making process. So this is actually a really interesting view into the brain of the decision-making engine. On the right, you'll see many possible rollouts that we're potentially scoring. And as you might imagine, our initial guess has a lot to do with how fast we make decisions. And in some cases that are really uncertain, having that guess be accurate means that we can make decisions much more quickly and we go through iterative interaction resolution much more quickly. We actually use machine learning offline to train uh, a model that actually makes a really good initial guess. In, in just sort of average cases, we can see a speed up of on the order of 10 milliseconds uh, in this reflexive update step, but also on the order of 80 milliseconds in the worst case scenarios. And worst case here, means it's a really uncertain scene and we actually don't know what the right solution is and it's gonna take two or three or four iterative steps to come up with the right safe and comfortable decision. Last and not least, my favorite topic, vehicle dynamics and control. Uh, this is a really inter interesting image. Um, this was sent out over Twitter a while ago and what it really illustrates is the difference between having compensation uh, using high fidelity models for the dynamic world and the dynamic vehicle versus not having those models. This is the right and the left example. So without compensation on the left, you can imagine this is how most humans would drive. We don't have high fidelity models necessarily running in our brains at 100 milliseconds to figure out exactly how to drive this smoothly. The example on the right is the output of what, how the cruise AV drives. And I can tell you it is incredibly smooth and that's because we've used all of the best techniques from motion planning, optimal control, robust control, to with very high frequency um, incorporate decisions from these models and take those decisions and send them to the actuators so we drive safely and comfortably. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how world understanding and decision making need to work together despite all of the challenges you and I talked about to come up with safe and comfortable driving decisions. And we showed a bunch of examples and these are really good examples for highlighting the point. But if you've seen presentations about autonomous vehicles before or watch videos, you'll know that it's not about just getting these isolated examples right that we might have just cherry picked. So what's really exciting is we're releasing today several long drive videos on YouTube that you can go watch. And I encourage you to go to them. You don't have to watch all two hours of them like I did, but scrub to any random spot in the video, pick a point, and I bet that within 30 seconds, probably even sooner, you'll see the types of examples that I talked about. The need for extremely fast reflexes, the need to have very proactive conflict resolution in highly uncertain scenarios, and the need to account for modeling error when the world is doing something that we just haven't predicted or maybe we haven't seen before. Getting this right in isolated examples isn't the goal. The goal is superhuman driving, which means getting this right with incredibly high frequency and reliability. So with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Sid, who's gonna to talk to us about simulation.